Hello everyone and welcome back to my five acres of land here in the pine forests of southwest Finland. In the last video I showed you the house and the outbuildings. If you haven't seen that already do go take a look. Today though and it's a few days later I want to show you the land. What's on it and what I hope to do with it. For those of you who are new to my channel, my name is Daniel and for the last seven years or so I've been creating a self-sufficient home in rural Northwest Ireland, restoring buildings, growing food and keeping a range of animals from chickens to pigs, ducks, rabbits and many more. And a lot of you discovered my channel here on YouTube through the videos I made about my life there. But it was time for a change and if you want to know why, watch my first Moving to Finland video in which I talk about just that. So in September of this year, just three and a bit months ago, we bought this property, a traditional log framed house built 99 years ago and set on two hectares or five acres of land here in Finland, just two kilometers from the sea. This time though, it wasn't just my adventure. With me came Angela, my partner, and our daughter, Juno, the newest addition to the Mossy Bottom family. And thank you for all the congratulations, by the way. And no, we're not Finnish speakers, as many of you have asked, nor do we have any family here. We just fell in love with the forests, the culture, and the opportunity that we saw here for our growing family. And as a little welcome to Finland, the weather gods have blessed us with one of the coldest winters in the last decade. In late November and early December, temperatures plummeted to as low as minus 18 degrees Celsius. The sea froze around us and the snow just kept falling up to 50 centimeters deep here at the house. Everyone said winter had come early and was here to stay, but this last few days, we've had a reprieve. The sun has fought back, the temperature has crept up to two or three degrees above freezing, and a lot of the snow has even melted. It's like an early spring, just in time for the midwinter solstice. How strange is that? And for me, that presents an opportunity to show you the land, because I'm sure it won't be long before those Siberian winds bring back the snow. Okay, let's go for a walk and see how far we can get. Behind me is the meadow, which stretches out from the house that you can see in the distance there for about two acres. It's predominantly southwest facing and right now is covered uh, beneath these patches of snow with wild grasses, bramble, raspberry, nettle, lupins, and all manner of other species of native plant, which have been left mostly to their own devices for decades. About half of the area in that direction we want to preserve as meadow. The other half behind me we're going to turn into a vegetable garden. This is actually the flattest section of land, easiest to work. It's also not waterlogged in the summer and autumn, unlike the parts around the pond, which I'll show you later in the video. I'm told that one of the big problems with growing food here in the forests of Finland, especially where we live in the southwest, is keeping the deer out. And believe me, there are a lot of them living here, white tail and roe deer. Thank you for all the comments, by the way, identifying the species. Almost every day we see them just meters from the house or when driving down the driveway. So to make this vegetable garden work, we're going to build a deer fence around the perimeter. I might even bury it 30 centimeters or so like I did with my rabbit fences back in Ireland to stop critters from digging their way in. What will we grow here? Well, more on that in future videos. Don't want to give everything away yet, but suffice it to say I am very excited about this vegetable garden and what future summers are going to yield. And we have some canny solutions in mind for the freezing Finnish spring too, if I can say it. Our plan is to be at least 60% self-sufficient in terms of what we eat as a family of three, though it might take us a few years to get there. Watch this space and the videos I make, of course. 
Behind the barns, there is this track, if you can call it that, which winds its way through the forest to the far end of our land. In the spring, along with a hundred other jobs, I hope to clear this track of tree roots and overhanging branches, making it usable again, because it leads all the way to the far end of the meadow and what you might call, if you're being kind, the orchard. Let's go there now and take a look. Behind me you can see the remnants of an old deer fence which encircles an area of high ground, again south facing with plenty of sun, at least in the summer, within which there are about 30 to 40 dwarfing cultivars of plum and cherry tree. When we arrived here in mid-September, some of these trees still had fruit on, though I think they were being raided every day by deer coming in through this forest that had broken through the fence. I reckon though, if I rebuild this fence, take out the birch, the spruce, and the pine trees which have self-seeded there, then prune and mulch the cherry and plum trees, that I might have a ready-made source of fruit every year, and plenty of it too, for jellies, jams, drinks, bottling, and dehydrating, as well as enjoying fresh on hot summer days. As you can see, there is no shortage of these fruit trees, and I have to admit I was delighted when I discovered this area. In Ireland, you may remember I planted a forest garden with apple, cherry and pear trees, but it takes years for those trees to mature enough to yield significant amounts of fruit. Here, with some work and yearly maintenance, I've got a free source of food on tap. The gaps, and there are plenty where trees have died, I'll plant some other species and cultivars. Pear, apple, maybe even peach. Perhaps some nut trees too. Hazel will definitely do well, maybe even almond. The cultivars grown locally, which my neighbors think will do well. Some might fail, but I'm sure many will succeed too. And that's half the fun of growing things. I cannot wait. Now you may remember in the last video where I gave you a tour of the buildings that I promised you one more outbuilding, a somewhat secret one. Well, secret, yes it is, hidden in these trees at the very far end of the property with no other buildings in sight, but that's about the only nice thing about it. Here it is, an old shed, possibly used as a hunting blind, I'm not really sure. Inside there is a homemade stove and a wide window looking down in this direction through the orchard and onto the pond. This is not a very nice building to be in, and interestingly, it's by far the newest on the property. Definitely less than 50 years old, I'm sure of it. It's also the only one which is substantially damaged. You can see the roof has collapsed, the floor doesn't feel very good, there's mould and damp absolutely everywhere. When you compare it though to the sauna, which is a similar size, but probably twice as old and in much better condition, it makes you realize just how well designed and made those traditional log framed buildings were. This is just timber framed, packed with insulation, no logs at all. Many people have said to me that if you look after a log framed house, it will last forever. And I think that might just be true. I certainly wouldn't want to live in this building though. It's full of damp and mold. So let's get out of here. The location though, right next to that shed is magical. Looking up into the pine forests and rocky hills and down to the orchard and pond. This is where my pretty amateur camera really doesn't do justice to the environment. It is the perfect little hideaway from civilization. So my plan is to remove this shed completely and in its place to build a tiny cabin, similar to the cabin that I built in Ireland, which was just 20 square meters, and use it as a summer house for volunteers. And yes, I do plan to take volunteers here, just as I did at Mossy Bottom in Ireland. I worked as a volunteer on organic farms and ranches in Canada for a year, and it was one of the best experiences of my life. And the volunteers who stayed with me in Ireland made such a huge contribution and I think took away a great deal from the experience too. It's a great way to share skills in exchange for labor 
and enthusiasm. Although I'm an introvert, yes, introverts can speak to cameras too, folks. I do love bringing people into my little world, and I know Angela does too. One of the negatives or criticisms people often have for this way of life uh, is the perceived isolation. But though I am someone uh, who is quite comfortable with solitude, I have never ever, when living at Mossy Bottom, felt isolated. I felt far more isolated living in cities uh, in which I didn't feel motivated to share what I had with others because I wasn't proud of it. In this life, I am proud, so I want to bring others into my world. I think isolation is mostly a choice, and yes, some people who choose to live this way choose also to isolate themselves, but it's a misconception that you have to. If you're a people person, then you just have to figure out ways to bring people into your world. And that is not as hard as you might think in the 21st century. Okay, I also promised you a pond. <laughs> and here it is, although perhaps more an ice rink than a pond right now. Even with this minor heat wave in the middle of winter, it hasn't melted. A week or two ago, I even walked across this. It was so frozen. Uh, it covers an area of about 900 square meters or a quarter of an acre. And you can see behind me, there are reeds growing around the edge. There's also a lot of wetland grass, which has taken over in places. Later in the year, when it's not frozen, I want to try and remove some of that grass, perhaps thin back the trees which have grown up around the pond and turn this whole area, uh, which is quite waterlogged anyway, into a place for wildlife. I can see frogs, newts, dragonflies, maybe even fish thriving here, as well as birds and deer, which I've already seen drinking from the pond many times before the deep freeze hit. It's not very deep, but I might even create a little pontoon for sitting and just relaxing and watching nature. You might be thinking that this would make a wonderful duck pond, and you're right, it would. That was my first thought too. But my concern if I were to introduce domestic ducks here would be predation. This is quite far from the house and it's surrounded by forest with lots of foxes, polecats, and even the occasional lynx active at night. So although I do plan to get poultry again, I think they'll have to be contained better if I want to keep them alive and closer to the house. But I'm quite sure native duck species and other species of bird will make use of this pond anyway. And creating a wildlife zone is for me an absolute privilege. It's something I've always wanted to do. I just didn't have enough space and land in Ireland until now. Next, into the forest. About one hectare of the land which we own, that's about half, looks pretty much like this. A mixture of pine, birch and spruce of all different ages with some oak and maple too, especially near the house. In the first Moving to Finland video, I showed you a view up into the pine forest, but most of that was actually my neighbor's forest. So yes, some of it had been managed. This area, the one hectare that we have, has not been managed at all. And I think you can see that behind me. And we were specifically looking for somewhere with at least a few acres of trees in order to heat our home during the freezing winters here. And this is something I did in Ireland too, managing trees in my hedgerow sustainably for firewood. The difference, I only had a tiny caravan to heat and the winters there rarely dropped below freezing. I was still able to generate several cubic meters of firewood though, just from my hedgerows. I'll need twice that though, at least here, uh, with a house to heat and a family inside to keep warm. There are two stoves in our house, in the kitchen and the lounge, both of which we're using every day right now. And we expect to until at least April or May. Thank God for the trees, we'll need them. But of course, I won't be clear felling these trees. This first winter, I'll take the standing deadwood, which should season in just one year, and there's plenty of it, believe me. I'll also take out trees around the barns and along the tracks. Then each uh, subsequent winter, I'll thin the forest, taking just enough trees to heat my home once seasoned. 
and you might be thinking what a lot of hard work when I can just set a little thermostat and pay a bill every couple of months. But let me tell you there are few greater joys in life than setting out on a cold but sunny winter's day rather like this one uh, and there are many of those here believe me to fell trees, buck logs and stack firewood. The sense of quiet fulfillment combined with exhaustion, contented exhaustion, when you finally sit down to have dinner at the end of the day is quite honestly unlike anything I've ever felt working in an office or a mainstream job and I've done my fair share of that too. Uh, to earn money, to pay for someone else to heat my house. To make this work, this native forest has to keep me and my family warm every winter while also being a resource for mushrooms, for berries, blueberries and lingonberries do really well here in the summer, and of course a home for wildlife. So it has to remain a forest. Sustainability is key if you want to be self-sufficient. And yes, that is a giant anthill. There are of course many more secrets to this land, some of which I'll reveal to you in future videos like this giant glacial boulder which I'm eyeing up as a new meditation stone, essential for every introvert out there like me. And do watch my video from a few years ago on thriving as an introvert if you haven't already, it's certainly one of my videos that I'm most proud of. And my plans for the land are of course far more extensive than I've had chance to talk about today. I've just scratch the surface. From fox-proof chicken enclosures to compost areas, greenhouses and so on. But I'm kind of hoping you folks will stick around for the journey. I have a bit more experience than I did when starting up in Ireland seven years ago. But no doubt I'll still make mistakes. I'm prepared for that. As I always say, Never be afraid to fail, because failing, learning, and then succeeding is probably the single best thing you can do with this life, and by far the most satisfying. Sadly, this meditation stone is a bit too icy to sit on and meditate on right now. Alas, I might have to wait till the spring. A huge thank you to everyone who has been in touch via Instagram or email, be it to welcome me and my family, offer advice, or even offer help. There have been so many nuggets of wisdom in those messages and comments. Like, for instance, plowing my snow strategically so as to create a mini sledding hill for the little one, and perhaps the not so little one too. I would never in a million years have thought to do that. Genius. Come back snow, you've only been gone a week, but I really miss you already. Remember, you can join me on Patreon if you want to support the channel, where Angela, my partner, has launched a new blog series with a new post all about Christmas. For today though, from me and my little family here in the wilds of Finland, take very good care of yourselves, throw an extra log on the fire, and bye for now. See you soon. Set farewell for a better life at last. 
best. And for five years more I studied hard, and the state paid harder still. For that better life I earned my debt on her education bill. Till I threw my cap and they all did clap and shake my hand and say, Well done, my son, our work's begun, you'll pay that debt one day.